But first, this hour, we return to the low country of South Carolina as the investigation into the death of Stephen Smith heats up. Stephen was found dead in the middle of a country road in 2015. It was ruled a hit and run, something many people are questioning. Chanley Painter returns to the scene of the crime as we go through newly released documents and audio recordings with Stephen Peterson, the investigative consultant who has spoken to witnesses witnesses, examined evidence, and investigated this case. Tonight, we are live from the Low Country, taking an in-depth look at the death of Stephen Smith. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got two big hours tonight, two big stories. We'll get back to the Gwyneth Paltrow story in the next hour. This hour, though, we're going to start with a case everyone is talking about, and it goes back to 2015 when Stephen Smith was found dead in the middle of a road in the low country of South Carolina. At the time, it, it had local notoriety, but there weren't a ton of uh, media outlets from around the country and around the world talking about it. Well, they are now. And they are because of what happened this year, which was the prosecution of Alec Murdoch, who was convicted in 2023. Now, from the outside looking in from here, it's like, well, how? What does one thing have to do with the other? Well, that's really the question here, and it's a big question. We don't know. That's why this investigation is now heating up, and people are hoping to get some answers as to whether or not there is any connection. But the fact that Alec Murdoch has been convicted changes a lot down in that part of the country, especially down in Hampton County. It, it really changes the perception of the influence of the Murdochs and their ability to control investigations, control narratives, and perhaps skirt justice. That's over. That game ended with that conviction for double murder by Alec Murdoch. Now he's facing a series of things we know about that, but let's get back to uh, Stephen Smith, because uh, there was an investigation, and a lot of those materials have now been released from the original investigation, which seemed to come to the conclusion that this was a hit and run. Which, by the way, a hit and run, you still have to solve the case because somebody struck him, killed him, and then left the scene. We don't know if they did it on purpose or if, they did, if it was an accident. But what we really don't know is if that even happened. Or if it was just the fact that his body was found in the road and there was a presumption and an assumption that it was a hit and run. Does the evidence match the conclusion? And by the way, we still have to figure out who's responsible for this. There's a family that deserves answers, um, and, and, and someone needs to be brought to justice for what happened here. So we're focusing a lot on this this week. Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent, is returning to the scene and is back down in the low country, visiting different locations, speaking to people, and going through all of those documents that have now been released and trying to put some pieces together here. And Chanley Painter joins us now live uh, from Hampton County, South Carolina, where she has been all day, where there's been some weather, some rain, et cetera. Uh, Chanley, great to see you. So let's start with the scene of, of the death of Stephen Smith, where someone took his life. One way or the other, someone took his life. Uh, what did you see today? What did you find out? And what sort of uh, struck you about the scene? Yeah, great to be with you, Vinny. I'm here in downtown Hampton, South Carolina, in Hampton County, about 10 miles, uh, actually like 10 minutes from where I'm standing, would be the location where 19-year-old Stephen Smith's body was found in the middle of the road. And like you said, it was a bit rainy earlier this afternoon when we were out there, but here is what I learned. Let's watch. It was here along this rural Hampton County Road in the early morning hours of July 8th, 2015, where a passing motorist spotted a body lying here on the center line and called 911. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? Hell, uh, I just going down the wrong Crockerville Road. 
Mm. I see somebody laying out. It was a warm Wednesday morning around 4 a.m., so that means it was dark out here. There are no street lights on this narrow two-lane highway, just some power lines. The road flanked by a field on one side and then trees on the other with a couple of houses around the area. But within minutes, on that early morning, Hampton County Sheriff's officers responded to the scene. They soon requested the South Carolina Highway Patrol, but what they saw here raised a lot of questions. The location of the body was odd. There was no glass in the road, no skid marks or other vehicle debris. The victim, who police later identified as 19-year-old Stephen Smith, had no injuries consistent with someone being struck by a vehicle in the road. In fact, his loosely tied tennis shoes were still on his feet and his undamaged cell phone and car keys were still in his front pocket. Stephen Smith looked only to have trauma to the right side of his head that investigators first believed was a gunshot wound. Anthony, according to reports at that scene, the assistant uh, coroner pointed out to the investigators what she believed to be a defensive wound on the victim's hand. But ultimately, later that day, when Stephen Smith's body was taken to autopsy, the medical examiner determined that it was a cause of death was due to an apparent hit and run accident. And that, of course, changed the course of the investigation from then on out. Let's take a look. I actually. Go ahead. I want to show you this scene as mapped out in 2015, Vinny, because, uh, again, SLED was involved initially in the investigation because those initial first responders believed that this was a homicide. Here's what that uh, depiction looks like from investigators. This is the, the SLED crime scene. Investigators put this together. Uh, it shows the positioning of the body in the middle of the road. Uh, those first responders really only noted injuries to the head area. There were no broken bones, we later learn. Um, and then... The location itself was suspicious, according to this, uh, these reports, because usually a hit and run, a body isn't usually still in the road when being struck by a vehicle moving 55 miles per hour. And also, uh, his shoes were still on his feet. His phone was undamaged. His cell phone's still in his front pocket, along with his keys. This phone is key to the investigation. However, they had trouble unlocking that cell phone, Vinny. I have confirmed they did unlock it in 2017. Uh, it is now in the possession of SLED, of course, but that will be key uh, leading up to who may be responsible for this. But uh, another thing that stands out is the location of the body of Stephen Smith and, of course, where his uh, vehicle is found is only a few minutes from where he's now buried. Uh, we passed it several times today uh, working on uh, on these elements and putting together the story for you tonight. Here's what it looks like. It was definitely the most decorated uh, grave site in the entire cemetery, Gooding Cemetery. Uh, his mom, Sandy Smith, has told me that she likes to collect uh, cats, uh, cat figurines, and place them at the grave there. He loved he loved animals, he loved cats. Uh, and this uh, grave, uh, this headstone was actually provided by funds from a GoFundMe account uh, a year or two ago. They raised money to make this nice, uh, beautiful headstone. You can see it right from the road, uh, Vinny, as you drive up and down Bamberg Highway, not far uh, from, oh, actually it's on Sandy Run uh, Road, not far from where, where he passed away. All right, Chanley, stand by. I want to bring you to our conversation uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, investigative consultant Steve Peterson. Uh, Steve, uh, great to see you again tonight. I know you've spent a lot of time working this uh, case. Let me start with, with what I saw. I saw a road that seemed very straight in one direction. The other direction, there was a bit of a curve. Um, is there any theory by those who believe it's a hit and run which way the car was even going? No, I, I don't believe there was uh, any theory in that respect. As you said, in the middle of the night, there's no street lights. There was little ambient light from, from the moon. Uh, the weather was just not, it wasn't a starry, bright lit night. So uh, you couldn't really tell from that location you're showing right at the moment. You can see it straight, but looking back the other way, there's a slight curve. They show a cornfield on one side. Corn was quite high back then. 2015 on the other side there were more woods they've since harvested a lot of the trees so that lot looks more mowed down but back then you can see trees on one side corn field 
on the other side. Um, so you can't really tell in which direction the vehicle was traveling if, in fact, it was a vehicle that struck Stephen. Right. And, 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 and I, don't, I always come back to that because the first thing I think about is it's not a super busy road. It's not a super highway, right? So if you're walking down the road, would you hear the car coming? Would you see the lights coming, whether it was behind you or in front of you? And, and how would you end up getting struck? It, it, it makes no sense to me how you could be wandering down the road and hit under those circumstances uh, on that particular road. Yeah, no, you're right, especially at night. You'd see the oncoming headlights long before the car got close to you or the truck got close to you. You would have indication that there was a vehicle coming. And in fact, Sandy, Stephen's mom, was a very adamant that he would not have been walking in the road. He would have been along the side or even kind of in off in the ditch. Um, you know, being a 19-year-old openly gay man in that part of the of that part of the state, uh, he's very reluctant to be out in the middle of the road. He, he's more secretive or more guarded, we'll say, than uh, than the average person. So he wouldn't have been in the middle of the road. What did you think of the, posi his body the position? Was there. Yeah. What did you think of the position of the body? And the, you know where it was found, the position that it was in, um, the fact that the cell phone is not damaged. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that come into mind. You know, I I am not a highway uh, investigator. That, that's not my forte. I was a paramedic many 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 years ago. I've seen more than my share of car accidents, but I didn't investigate them. So a lot of the information that I received. Uh, regarding the accident, I would forward on to my colleagues who are also retired. Some of them are active duty in various agencies across the Southeast. And I would say, give me your impression of this. Tell me this. Would this happen? Would that happen? Is this unusual? Is that unusual? And there's really no answer to any of it because you can come up with a scenario that could explain all of it. We just don't know what that scenario is. As I discussed with you last time, you know, we had two theories of what happened. And based on the information that I received from SLED, we kind of discounted one and then focused more on the other. The other, the second theory, being that it was an accidental vehicle strike, that a, a vehicle did hit him. And, uh, and that there was, may have been some damage to the vehicle, but the vehicle may have been damaged ahead of time. The mirror may have already been broken, so there wasn't any glass to be found because there wasn't any glass in the mirror. It could have just been the frame of the mirror that struck him. Don't know all the details. And at this point now, nearly eight years later, you'd be hard pressed to find that you have any physical evidence left. I want to take a listen, uh, another listen to that 911 call, because this is how the investigation starts. Let's, let's take a listen. Hampton County 911, where's your emergency? Hell, um, I just going down the wrong um, Crockerville Road. Mm -hmm. I see somebody laying out. And is it in the road or on the side of the road? It, it, it's in the road. So in the road? Yeah. Okay, all right. We'll get an officer headed out that way to see what's going on. Oh, uh, I ain't moving or nothing like that, but um, somebody's going to hit him. It's dark. Uh -huh. Somebody's going to hit him. All right, we'll get an officer headed out that way. Do we know if, if this witness was ever interviewed? He was. He was interviewed by the Highway Patrol. I believe he may have been interviewed later on by SLED. But he's just a poor guy going to work first thing in the morning, drives by, sees this body in the road. He was quite scared that it was some kind of setup. So he didn't want to stop. He just kept going and called 911 immediately, reported it as he was driving away. And, and he was driving, it was it light out when he was driving? No, it was still dark. Still out. It dark, was like but he was able to see. In the morning. He was able to see a body laying in the road. Yet we're going to try to believe that someone driving down, seeing someone standing up and walking, didn't see the pedestrian. Well, you're right. He did see a body in the road with his headlights, and under my theory, the vehicle that was involved, the occupants were intoxicated. So they, they who knows what they saw. But so, they weren't paying attention. They were not. They were. They were. They were drunk. They were out driving, and and it was an accident that they struck Stephen. If my theory holds up. 
And what are your thoughts, uh, you know, after speaking with investigators who were at the scene? Because some of them questioned that it didn't look like a hit and run. What was it to them that didn't make it seem like a hit and run that others would say, yes, it, it, it could be? Well, some of the conclusions that you, you discussed earlier with Chanley, you got the shoes still on his feet. You have the body in the middle of the road, right on the line. And normally you would assume that if a vehicle struck a person, he would glance off in one direction or the other. And even my experience as a paramedic would show you that the shoes would fly off. If he had a phone loosely in his pocket, that might bounce out of his pocket, depending on how fast the vehicle was traveling when it struck him and depending on the significance or the, the angle of the blow. So there's a lot of things that take into effect. It could have been a glancing blow, but at a decent speed, a glancing blow can have deadly effects. So it's, you know, you, you, until you recreate it, until you know all the facts, it's hard to speculate. In fact, that's all we have is speculation. And we've got an unsolved case. That's the, that's, that's the main problem here. All right, Steve's going to stay with us this hour. Uh, Chanley Painter staying with us. We've got more uh, from down in the Low Country Plus coming up next hour. In Park City, Utah, Gwyneth Paltrow in court accused of causing a ski accident resulting in serious injuries. Today, the man she collided with, who was suing her, took the stand. After eight months, I had to tell her to leave. I said, I'm not asking now, I'm telling you, you gotta leave. She didn't buy in to me, not being the same person and coming, coming into a relationship, and I'm not sure I'm gonna get to back to normal again. Gwyneth Paltrow, the Hollywood actress being sued for a ski collision. This is a he said, she said on the slopes. The injured skier claims Paltrow ran into him, causing serious physical harm. I'd like to be vindicated. She denies the allegations and is counter suing for $1. Now, the jury will decide, and Court TV will bring it all to you. The Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash case. Live covered Tuesday mornings at 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. Was it suspicious to you? Yes. Why? Because he wouldn't have been in the road. Um, he had a cell phone in his pocket. It wouldn't be the first time he had to call for somebody, you know? And, um, but the car was locked. He had his phone and his key in his pocket. But then he left his wallet. So if you're going to go get gas, why would you leave your wallet in the car? And he wouldn't walk, it, no, he would have walked through the woods. He would not have been in that road. That's Sandy Smith, Stephen's mother. Uh, she's been looking for an answer, looking for justice for years now, and uh, we'll see. It, it seems like there's more momentum now in this investigation to whatever it leads to, but we have not gotten a definitive answer of how Stephen Smith died and who is responsible. This is a crime. Any way you look at it, this is a crime that needs to be solved. Um, so. You heard what Sandy had to say. Let's go back to Chanley Painter, who's in the Low Country uh, this week. So, Chanley, um, another part of the scenes involved here is where his car was, because apparently he's originally driving his own car. So, what did you find out when you went there, and where exactly was it? Vinny, it was a about four minute drive from the location of Stephen Smith's body where authorities say his vehicle was recovered. And you, you make a turn in the small community of Crockettsville. That's why we hear the 911 caller say Crockettsville Road. It's kind of the nearest area. And we were there, of course, and here's what we found. Let's watch. About three miles from where Stephen Smith's body was found, police used that key found in his pocket to unlock his yellow Chevy Avail found in this area right here on rural Bamberg Highway in Hampton County. The gas tank door was open and the gas cap was hanging out inside the car. They found the wallet of 19-year-old Stephen Smith. The car was locked. He had his phone and his key in his pocket, but then he left his wallet. So if you're going to go get gas, why would you leave your wallet in the car? 
Now we're in the car to make our way from the location where Stephen's car was found to the location where Stephen's body was found. And it's important to note that Stephen Smith's family does not believe that if Stephen had car trouble, if he ran out of gas, he would not have walked nearly three miles along this rural road with his cell phone in his pocket and not made a call to anyone for help. He had a cell phone in his pocket. It wouldn't be the first time he had to call for somebody, you know. Stephen's mother told me that she believes investigators did not properly process Stephen's vehicle for fingerprints or DNA or even sift through the items left inside his car. So while investigators at the scene believe that this was a homicide, not a hit and run, the medical examiner later in the day, though, determined that it was a hit and run. So that meant that SLED was out, and this case was exclusively in the hands of the Highway Patrol Multidisciplinary Accident Investigation Team. So, Vinny, that's uh, what the scene looks like. And, of course, it was raining while we were driving in the car, but hopefully you got a sense of the uh, remote, you know, two-lane highway road. It did take long, of course, to drive. Like I said, around four minutes. It's around three miles if someone was to walk that. Uh, it has been speculated possibly if, in fact, he did abandon his vehicle there that he maybe would have cut across the woods. You could have taken a shortcut across the woods, kind of in between those two red dots right there. Uh, we drove south on Bamber, took that right on. Sandy Run Road up to that other location that gives you a visual of what that area uh, looks like. Uh, and at the scene where the 2013 Chevy Aveo was recovered, like I said, it was locked, but they had the keys from still in his pocket. Uh, that's how they knew the uh, the car was his as they uh, did sift through some of the items. Uh, they took only one thing they noted of interest according to the police file, and that was the wallet inside the vehicle. Uh, the wallet, there is a photo of it. It's actually tucked away in between kind of the passenger side door and the seat. That's something that sticks out to us. Uh, kind of an odd sp spot to put a wallet, maybe he didn't realize it was there, um, but that's all they took from inside that car. And I have inquired, you know, where is this vehicle today? Because again, this was not processed like a homicide crime scene. Uh, this was uh, something where they just kind of sifted through to find out who the person in the road was. They wanted that identification. So this car is actually in the possession of Sandy Smith today, Benny. She still has it, wow. All right, let's bring back in Steve Peterson. An investigative consultant worked this case. So, um, was it was it was it was there a conclusion that the car did in fact run out of gas, and that's why it was where it was? Because we see the the tank is sort of open and the the lid is pulled out. Well, that's an interesting question. The I read in one of the reports, <clears throat> excuse me, that they attempted to start the car at the scene and it wouldn't start so they towed it they towed it to the hampton county sheriff's office when sandy went back to retrieve it some weeks later at the sheriff's office she was met out in the back parking lot with uh, by a sheriff's deputy who had a gas can and before, as they approached the car he immediately poured the gas into the tank the car started up so was it out of gas well, who knows they didn't try it in the parking lot of the sheriff's office when they went to retrieve the car. So I don't know. I don't know if they actually did try to start it and drive it. I, that, that seems kind of strange to me. You would think if they were treating it as evidence of any kind, they would just put it on a flatbed and tow it away. They wouldn't move it. They wouldn't drive it. They wouldn't start it up. They wouldn't do that if they were going to treat it as if it were, it had some evidentiary value. So I don't know. Uh, now, Everybody's reporting, you know, he would have called somebody. And of course, you know, I'm a father. I've got three young, well, they're not young anymore. I've got three daughters. And I can tell you, if they ran out of gas at 1.30, 2.30 in the morning, in the middle of nowhere, oh, I'd be getting a call. Somebody would be getting a call. My daughter's not gonna walk six miles. Because while Stephen's body was found three miles from the car, in less than another three miles in the opposite direction was Stephen's father's house. So. I am assuming that he was walking to his father's house. And he did make a call. He did. He called somebody. He asked them to come get him. 
The person that he called said, I don't have any gas in my car. The person that he called had been taking some type of drugs and alcohol. He wasn't in any condition to drive, and he explained that to Stephen. Stephen said, well, don't worry, don't come. And the person he spoke to on the phone said, well, don't walk. Don't." And he was, Stephen insisted he wasn't going to walk to where he was going. But the guy said, I could hear cars in the background. So I knew he was walking the road. I knew he was out there. And as maybe even Chanley experienced out in that area, you don't get a lot of good phone reception. So even while I was out there, I had spots where my phone would drop calls and I couldn't make contact with anybody. So that's not unusual either for that rural part of, uh, of the county. So let me ask you this, Steve. So how was that information determined that he did call someone? Did someone go through his entire, you know, his phone and go through his phone records? Or was it someone who received the call who came forward and said, yeah, he called me? Well, it was a combination of both. Because what happened was this case ping pong back and forth from agency to agency, right? We discussed that the other day. They get the call, there's a body in the road, the sheriff's office goes out there, Hampton uh, County Sheriff's Office goes out there with the coroner. And as we know, coroners in South Carolina are a political position. They really don't have much of any medical training or background. They go out there, they pronounce the body dead. They, uh, one of the deputy coroners looks at Stephen and says, oh my God, that's a gunshot. They call SLED. SLED comes out, the highway patrol was en route. SLED calls the highway patrol. Don't come out, it's a murder, it's a gunshot, we got this. Sled, I think one of the troopers was already there by the time, but the, the rest of the troopers don't come out. Sled takes the case, they, they have the body brought by the coroner to the medical examiner in Charleston. They do an autopsy there, they pronounce it uh, death by blunt force trauma, associated perhaps with a vehicle strike. Sled goes, not a murder, not our case. Tries to give, gives the case back to the highway patrol. The coroner, I, I'm, and I'm assuming it's the coroner, to be honest with you, I didn't follow up on this part of it. But the, then Stephen's body is transferred from Charleston to the funeral home, where he's subsequently prepared for the funeral. So by the time the highway patrol actually gets involved, Stephen's body, all his clothes, all the evidence stuff has been shifted to, to a couple of different agencies. There's no chain of custody that's complete. And the, the funeral parlor has all this stuff. So that's when the highway patrol picks up and, and starts where they immediately begin to question if it's a car accident. They start off believing this is a murder. This is not a, a car accident. And what I was never able to get clear is, well, if you're convinced it's a murder, what are you guys doing hanging on to this case? Wow. They claim that the county sheriff's office didn't want it and SLED wouldn't take it. So I'm saying no one ever asked us to take it, you know, so it's a let's point the fingers at everybody came. Not a good so situation when you when you're trying to get to the truth. Not a good situation. No. But uh, they did look at his phone tolls. They looked at they his did. phone records from that particular phone and they saw what numbers were called. And that person did come forward and say, yes, he called me. Um, and there was an interview done. There was a telephonic interview and I believe there was a face to face interview of which I heard both of the calls. Now, remember, I didn't get involved until 2021, a few weeks after the Alec Murtaugh or the Maggie and Paul murders. So by the time I get involved, it's already five years later. And this thing has sat for four and a half years cold. All right, Steve, stay with us. Chanley Painter still with us. When we come back, new details about the forensic testing on Steven's clothing. We'll take a look at that when we return. Gwyneth Paltrow. The Hollywood actress being sued for a ski collision. This is a he said, she said on the slopes. The injured skier claims Paltrow ran into him, causing serious physical harm. I'd like to be vindicated. She denies the allegations and is counter suing for $1. Now, the jury will decide, and Court TV will bring it all to you. The Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash case. Live covered Tuesday mornings at 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV.
This is a spot in Hampton County where Stephen Smith's body was found in 2015. There's now a memorial to honor his memory at this location. This is an area that is remote. There's a cornfield on one side of the highway. There's trees on this side of the highway. And here you can see it's only about 20 yards from the nearest home. Chanley Painter returning to the scene of the death of Stephen Smith down in the Low Country, South Carolina. She's with us now uh, in Hampton, uh, South Carolina. Chanley, what did we learn about and what did you learn from the new documents regarding the clothing uh, that Stephen Smith was wearing when, when he died, when he was found? Yeah, Minnie, we've been working hard really all weekend trying to sort through the original 2015 case file into Stephen Smith's death. And one of those forensic uh, state crime lab sheets kind of reveal how they uh, took the clothes into possession and then what they were testing on the clothes that Stephen Smith had on. So here's a look at some of the results from Sled. Uh, the black Nike short sleeve shirt he was wearing. Ultimately, no automotive paint found on it. The pair of khaki uh, cargo shorts he was wearing, no autom automotive paint found on it. And then, of course, the Airspeed footwear shoes still on his feet, no automotive paint found. And there was, uh, during his autopsy, de debris collected uh, from those items. And there were several single layer metallic blue paint chips found uh, due to the condition of the sample. Uh, no make, model, and year information was able to be obtained. Those uh, paint chips were suitable, though, for comparison should a standard become available. So again, this is being processed as a hit and run, Vinny. They're trying to match this with some sort of a vehicle. This uh, report goes on in the um, Highway Patrol case notes uh, to talk about how investigator J.D. James spoke to SLED agent Michael Moscal. And this is what he finds out. He says, Mr. Muscal advised that he located around 10 one millimeter single layer blue paint chips. Mr. Muscal advised that he needed more paint layer evidence to pinpoint a particular vehicle. Mr. Muscal advised that the uh, PDQ database indicated the paint could be from an industrial tool, a dumpster, or a signpost. Uh, Mr. Muscal added that Toyota used this particular paint on its vehicles from 1982 to 1982. 88. So again, they still presumably have these items of clothing and hopefully now that SLED is investigating as a homicide, more testing than it can be done as far as DNA, uh, stains, uh, other type of uh, information can be gleaned from this clothing, clothing because as of right now, it doesn't seem like there was sufficient amount of uh, evidence to connect it to a vehicle. So just a quick follow up on that. So where exactly were those paint chips located? Where were they found? Debris. So debris collected from items two through four, that would be the shirt, uh, the shorts, and the footwear shoes uh, were collected from him okay, as so it's he debris. was in um, autopsy. Got that. Maybe when you lay it out, it falls down, you find it. Um, now, there are some other tests done as well, right? There were other tests. This also stood out in that case file, Vinny. Uh, first, he uh, was swabbed for a gunshot residue. Remember when I told you earlier in your show that the first responders, particularly the EMS uh, and coroner, believed that because his uh, injuries were to one side of his head, it seemed like that was the only uh, spot. They believed it may have been a gunshot wound. And so they took GSR uh, from him. Um, and I'm learning tonight from the attorney that represents uh, Sandy Smith that there was no gunshot residue on Stephen Smith, according to her attorney. Also tested, or what stands out here, uh, a rape kit uh, was done on Stephen Smith as well. And I'm learning that from Sandy Smith's current attorney that was never processed, Vinny. So those were some of the other testing done. All right, Chanley, thank you. Let's bring back in Steve Peterson, investigative consultant, worked this case back in 2021. Um, and tried to put some pieces together in all of this because, uh, you know, again, it was not done. This is not the way you investigate something, the way it was originally investigated by law enforcement, back and forth, different agencies. Um, what are your thoughts about the paint chips, uh, Steve? Well, the paint chips could mean something. Then again, they could mean nothing. You know, we thought perhaps one of the theories was perhaps an object was stuck out the car window 
like as if you were going to, for the lack of a better example, joust. You would have a a, a, a stick or a, a baseball bat or some type of object that you go out. Because one of the my first theory was they were just messing with Stephen. They were kind of goofing around. And that's why Stephen was in the road, because he knew these people, wasn't afraid of them. And then these guys took it to the next level. And before you know it, Stephen struck, falls down, and it's, man, it's horrible. People involved, terrified, they flee the area. That was, that was one theory. So I spoke with the trooper who, was, who did a lot of the um, evidence collection and interviews. I spoke with him personally. And it was interesting to me because he's no longer a trooper, but he also he also asked me some bizarre questions. And then uh, it seemed like he was interested in selling his story more than telling his story. So everybody here seemed to have an agenda. Uh, you know, there was a shortly after the Stephen Smith uh, accident, maybe two years, eh, I guess three years, two and a half years after Stephen was killed. Uh, you know, a trooper was in a horrible accident. And Alec Murtaugh represented him. Then he cheated him on all, out of all the money that he won from the suit. So, I mean, everybody seems to have an agenda or a reason for being involved in this thing. And it's just difficult to see where people's own personal bias and agendas led them. Nobody interviewed Buster. I tried, but they wouldn't let me do it because it was right after the Paul and Maggie murder. So... They were not allowing the Buster Murtaugh to talk to anybody. So I couldn't interview him. The highway patrol who was running this thing, because no one else would, they never interviewed him. There are a lot of dropped leads, a lot of questions not asked, a lot of answers still left out there that I was trying to get. I, just, I went as far as to interview the farmer who owns the cornfield next to the accident scene to see if perhaps when he was harvesting, when he was plowing his fields, did he come across a bat? Did he come across any type of stick, any type of object that could be used as a weapon? Of course, he said no, but he did have a lot of people over the next year or two, um, especially after uh, the Murtaugh murders, suddenly show up in his field with metal detectors and looking around, and it was just really bizarre. Wow. Uh, and a lot of it is just people flocking to the scene. You know, they flocked all this... Uh, when uh, when there's a lot of uh, attention, exposure. yeah.